you're able to stand up for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel this morning is a reading from St. Matthew in the 20th chapter. These are the words of Jesus. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same, and about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. So when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last, and then going to the first. When those hired, about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, using Psalm 139 are from the last week, we're, we're kind of learning together individually and as a, as a congregation uh, this theme about how God uh, weaves us together, knits us together, actually, is how the psalm uh, put it. Uh, but we changed it, well, actually, we did both ways last week. I kind of confused everyone. But God is weaving us together. And so, in order to kind of kick off kind of uh, the weeks and months of uh, learning again how God weaves us together, uh, weaves me together as a person and weaves us together, we had this little prayer that we prayed uh, together as a congregation. God, weave me together. God, weave us together. So, uh, that's kind of our prayer that kind of sets the tone uh, for God's work in our lives, that sets the tone uh, for us to notice God working in our lives and also God working in our community constantly weaving us together. I love that Philippians uh, a text where Paul says, only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So God weaves us, weaves me together, weaves you together so that when we might live uh, our lives in a manner that's worthy of the gospel. Um, and then Paul goes on to say uh, that, that we are to strive side by side with each other with one mind for the faith. You see, so there God is weaving me together, weaving you together, and then God is weaving us together so that we can stand side by side together striving for the one faith that we share. So we have this little prayer. God, weave me together. God, weave us together. I hope we can begin by praying it. Uh, and you're invited to pray it all week long if you want to. Uh, you, you can pray this prayer. God, weave me together. God, weave us together. You can, you can pray it every day. It's a simple prayer. God, weave me together. God, weave us together. And I won't change you. Okay, let's pray. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. God, weave me together. God, weave us together. Amen. In God's eyes, always, the little are big, the least are best, and the last are always best. In 
God's eyes, the little are big. The least are best, and the last are always first. I want you to do a little uh, game with me, a little memory, take a little memory trip with me, and I want you to think back to your childhood, if you, if you would. Um, and if that seems too long ago for some of you, then maybe just think about uh, your children, or maybe think about your grandchildren, and think about some of the things that children say. Just take a moment and think about what is, what is kind of the most common thing that you said as a child, what is the most common thing uh, that your children said or say as a child, you know, it kind of things like, you know, that just pop to my mind. Dad, everybody's doing this. Dad, everybody has a smartphone, right? Everybody, everybody. So, so just think of that. Just think of what are some things that your kids or you tend to say over and over again, and then if somebody's looking relatively friendly next to you, then just share that. Share that theme or that word with them, okay? So just think a little bit, what are some of the things that you said or your children say over and over and over again? And just share that with the person next to you. You see this innate sense of what is 
fair and what is not fair actually works to make our world a better place, doesn't it? And we all have this sense of fairness. We're born with it. The thing is, is that we don't always use it. Because that sense of fairness can also become quite egocentric as well. Meaning that the sense of fairness can be, well, this is not fair, and only looking at what is fair for me, or what is fair to me. So this sense of fairness can also be very egocentric as well, and certainly we see that when we hear little kids say something it's like, it's not fair that that person get a bigger piece of chocolate cake than, than what I get, because we're focusing on ourselves, right? It's egocentric. So it can also work the other way as well. And it, and it doesn't just have to be children where it works in the other way. It also can work in adults the other way, right? I mean, what is fair according to our, my own goals, my own wants, my own expectations, my own desires? You see how it quickly become kind of a me thing, right? Somebody said this at an earlier service. They said fairness is not, fairness is not, it does not mean that everybody gets the same thing. Fairness means that everybody gets what they need. And that isn't always the same, the same thing. I think I said that right. Did that make sense? Look about the parable that we read this morning. It's a parable about fairness, isn't it? It's a parable about fairness, about, it's really a parable about good people who, who all their lives have strived to live moral lives, to work hard and to take responsibility for their work in the kingdom of God. They have worked hard, and they just want things to be fair. They have this sense of, of fairness, and it's to such people who have this sense of fairness that Jesus speaks to, I think. For in the parable, they were the ones who grumbled about and begrudged the generosity of the landowner to the laborers. If you remember right, some of the laborers are chosen early. Some work all day out in the vineyard from early morning on. Some are chosen in mid-morning. Some are chosen at noon. Some are chosen in the afternoon. Some are chosen practically at the end of the day at 4 o'clock and the, what, the whistle blows at 5. They only worked in, they only worked in the vineyard for an hour. And so, the laborer tells the manager, we'll go and let's give the people their fair wage, the right wage. And so this act of generosity of the landowner kind of sets up some expectations of all the people that had gathered there to work. Those who had worked all day started doing kind of their mental math. They were doing this, their mental calculations. After all, if the folks who worked just one hour got a full day's wage, wouldn't it be only fair to give the folks who worked all day long a little more? Or maybe even a lot more? They put in a lot more hours, right? And so you see their expectations had just been deep because of the generosity of the landowner. But that's not what happens, is it? That's not what happens in this story. What happens in the story? They all get the same. They all get the same daily wage. It just doesn't seem, what's the word? Fair. But the landowner reminds them that, in fact, it's totally fair. The landowner reminds them it's fair they're being paid just what they were promised to be paid. If anything, the landowner is being more than fair. Actually, the landowner is being downright generous to those who were invited late in the day as well as perfectly fair to those who had worked all day in the vineyard. The landowner asks this question, are you envious? Because I am generous. Are you full of envy? Because I choose to do the things with what I own and 
give them to others as I choose. Are you envious because of that? Are you full of envy because of that? And so that's the question for all of us. Aren't we envious? Have we ever been filled with envy at what others get or what others have? I think that we've all been guilty of this at one time or another. It's interesting that the first mention of sin in the Old Testament appears, uh, perhaps surprising to many of us, it is not in the story of Adam and Eve and then being in the garden, which sometimes we think of the first mention of sin to be in that story is not there. Actually, the first mention of sin is found in the story of Cain and Abel. You remember Cain through Abel. And the first mention of sin is not because Cain killed Abel, but the first mention of sin is found in the place in the Bible where it says that Cain was envious of Abel. That is the first mention of sin in the Old Testament. Interesting, isn't it? So it seems that our original sin is this sin of being envious of others. And I think we've all been consumed by that at one time or another. I mean, we're taught to admire those who put in long hours and who keep their eyes on the prize, those who have never accepted, you know, any gain except for the things that they've worked for in this life. And they've tried to live their lives with an ethic of work, right? That they put in a good day's work and they've received a good day's wage for that. And and we strive for that. I think particularly I see it in many of you. You strive for that high work ethic and it is a very good, it's a good thing, that strong work ethic. It's it's we appreciate that and that runs deep in our bones. But just as the landowner in the parable calls all those who are standing around idly to the work of the vineyard, God calls all of us to do our part. I mean, God doesn't allow some people to stand there all day and do nothing. God calls everybody into the vineyard to work. Everybody is called to work in God's kingdom. The point is that when it comes to God's kingdom, it's God's grace. God's grace that outshines everything else. It's God's grace that outshines even our every desire to think that we ought to get what we deserve in this life. Because guess what? We do not get what we deserve in this life. None of us gets what we deserve in this life. If you're burdened with illness, if you're diagnosed with cancer, are you getting what you deserve in this life? Nobody gets what they deserve in this life. If you're wealthy, if you've been blessed, do you get what you deserve? None of us gets what we deserve in this life. This parable in God's kingdom is about grace. And thank goodness it's about grace. Thank goodness we don't get what we deserve when it comes to God's grace, right? God just gives it because God is this generous and giving God. And we just live in it. We live in this generosity. We're not envious of others because they might be better than us or are doing better than us. We don't carry that envy around. Why? Because we are woven together. Because God weaves us together in God's grace and in God's generosity. We are all one together in God's grace and God's generosity. God weaves you together. God weaves us together. And thank goodness God does. Thank goodness God does.